Fungi are a very, very broad topic. Um, pretty much any one of these slides that, that I'm going to show you guys, I could probably spend an hour talking about, um, about each one of them. But without, a, without anything else, we'll, we'll get going. And so, so first, kind of what, what are fungi? Um, and, you know, I, I like to think that I'm a fun, I'm a fun guy. Um, uh, um, it's, it's weird to do this without it, without an audience, but um, fungi are a, are a kingdom of, uh, a kingdom of organisms. And so as we think about how, how, um, how life is classified, we have six main kingdoms um, and Fungi are one of those six, and so a very, very broad group. But one thing that all, all fungi have in common is their main body is, is only one cell thick. And so that mycelia or that, that thread-like structure that you see is only going to be one cell thick. Um, their cell walls are made of chitin. Um, similar to plants, fungi do have cell walls, um, but with plants, those cell walls are made of cellulose. And so that's one of the ways that we can differentiate them. Also, fungi are heterotrophic, which means they cannot create their own food source. Um, and so un unlike plants that have, um, that have chloroplast and chlorophyll and can take energy from the sun, Fungi need to get their energy from somewhere else. And normally that's going to be on, um, on living material. Often it's going to be dead or dying material, but they can also um, get, their, get their nutrition from, um, from a perfectly healthy living host as well. Fungi will multiply sexually, they multiply asexually, and there's a lot of them that will multiply both ways. And we have, as, we, as we're then kind of breaking down our fungi a little bit more, the ones we tend to care most about are the pathogens. And so we have a lot of fungal pathogens of, of plants. But we also have fungi that are, are symbiotes. And so they have a, um, a beneficial or a mutualistic um, relationship with, excuse me, um, with their host. And we also have fungi that are saprophytes meaning they're not really doing much of anything, or at least science has not discovered what beneficial role they are, they are there yet to play. Um, and so often with any plant material that any plant that's out um, outside, there are tons and tons of fungi that are living on that, on that plant. When I get a tree sample into the clinic, that's one of the most difficult things is differentiating the, um, the numerous saprophytic fungi that are um, living on that living on that tree on that dead branch, not causing any problem, but separating those saprophytes from the pathogens. And I had mentioned the um, how we classify life, and we have our we have our main kingdoms. This is a this is a sketch of the of the tree of life, and. There's a lot of a lot of stuff on here, and I don't expect you guys to read all of it. Um, but I did want to draw your attention to the the things that I have highlighted here. And so, as we if we look down in the uh, in the opus opi opus thalcons, um, kingdom, that tends to be where we have our animals. But fungi are also in that same kind of in that same group. And if we move a little bit, a little bit further up, still on that left side of the screen, we have our um, archaea plastida. That's where we have our plants. And so whether it is your tomatoes, your trees, your, um, your grass, all of those, all those land plants are in, are in that area. And then if we go to the complete opposite side of the tree, we have our, o -O our oomycetes. And so Oomycetes are the water molds. And so anyone who's dealt with um, Phytophthora or Pythium in their, in their landscapes or in, a, um, in their garden, those are, some, um, those are some really big, really big pathogens, but very, very, um, very, very far from normal fungi. 
Um, and then even further away from normal fungi are these are the slime molds. So while we may think about some of those oomycetes or those water molds as, as being fungal-like, same with our slime molds, they are fungal-like. They are about as far away from fungi, at least on the evolutionary scale, as we can possibly be. I'm always amazed how, how close related to, um, to animals fungi are. The, one of the jokes that I would always make with, um, with some vegetarian friends of mine is that, you know, that mushroom that you're eating is much more closely related to, um, to your pet cat than, than it is to um, the tomato that you're eating. So. But we're gonna um, quickly go through the different, the different groups of fungi. And so one, that, one group that we deal with the least are the chytrids. And the chytrids tend to be um, mainly aquatic. They have flagella and they will kind of swim. A lot of chytrids can be um, pathogens as well. They may be pathogens of algae. And so we do have chytrids that, that will infect algae. But unfortunately, one of the most damaging things that chytrids do is they are quite pathogenic. Um, certain chytrids are very pathogenic to amphibians and especially frogs. And there is a lot of, a lot of frog death that's occurring due to um, due to an infection with these with these chytrids and the picture that I have here, all that white kind of growth on the um, on top of the frog that we that we see there, that that is the chytrid growing all over it. Um, and so not as big of a problem here in Nebraska, but we do have chytrids that that infect um, frogs here in Nebraska. But if we go into Central America or South America. There are certain species of frogs that are really threatened with extinction because of this fungal chytrid um, that's pathogenic. The next group are our zygomycetes. Um, it's a really fun word to say, zygomycete. But these are a lot of our decayers. And if you've ever had that loaf of bread um, that sat for maybe a little bit longer than it should have, and you opened it and it was all green and blue and black, that hat was infected with a, with a zygomycete. And so most zygomycetes tend to, be, tend to be our decayers. And so in nature, they're actually very beneficial. Um, we don't have many pathogens that, um, that um, we don't have many zygomycete pathogens, um, at least um, pathogens of plants plants or animals. Um, however, as we can see there, we, they can infect other mushrooms. And so it's actually pretty common to have mushrooms that are infected with a secondary, a secondary fungus. And one of the cool things about zygomycetes is they, they have similar, um, some similar structures to, to some, of our, um, some of our plants as well, especially some, some of our grasses. And so they have stolons, and those stolons, just like with just like with plants, they grow along the they grow along the roots or they grow along the surface. Um, and so you can really see these kind of thick um, thick growths that um, that help to help the spread uh, help the zygomycetes spread, and then they'll actually anchor at, with rhizoids, and so the rhizoids are kind of the roots. Um, for zygomycetes. Next group I'm going to talk about are our glomeromycetes. One of our, within the soil, um, over 50% of all soil fungi belong in the glomo, glomeromycete um, group. And that's because glomeromycetes contain our mycorrhizae. Um, and so mycorrhizae they create, they form a symbiotic relationship with plants that basically just extend the root zone. Um, and we have a few different types of mycorrhizae. We have our endo, um, our endomycorrhizae and our, um, our entomycorrhizae. And the endo ones will actually, um, will actually form structures on the inside of the, inside of the root tissue and spread spread their ways out. The ectomycorrhizae, they, they, um, 
they may have some fun, some hyphae that, that go into the root, but they don't actually colonize the root tissue. Instead, they kind of create this fungal mantle that encompasses the root um, to help extend the root zone. And mycorrhizae, as I'm sure you, you guys all know, very, very beneficial. Um, a lot of research shows that, that plants with a, with a strong mycorrhizae um, association tend to, um, they tend to tolerate drought conditions much better because that root zone is so much, is, is expanded so much. They're also a lot better at some nutrient um, degradation. Fungi are very good at decaying phosphorus. Plants aren't so good at decaying phosphorus. And so one of the, what, what, what happens is the fungus will take some carbon from the plant and in turn, the, the plant will take some of that phosphorus from the, um, from the fungus. Um, next group are our ascomycetes. And so most of our pathogens tend to be ascomycetes. And the um, ascomycetes are our sac fungi. And so down in there on the bottom, we have some of the common sacs. And so if you've ever looked at, especially if you've ever looked at, um, say, a, a spruce branch and seen these black little pimple-like structures all the way along the branch, those are parathesia. Um, parathesia, or they may be cleistothesia, depending on what fungus we're looking at. But those are the actual fungal fruiting structures. And within each one of those sacs, there are a whole bunch of Asci, um, or ascus, is the, is the plural for it. And within each ascus will be a number of ascospores. And so we often think about spores as being the reproductive structure of fungi. And it is for most, um, but those ascospores are produced within the asci um, with, that's produced in, inside that sac. I had mentioned most of our pathogens tend to be ascomycetes, but I'm sure some of you have noticed the the picture that I have on the upper right hand corner, um, and maybe you're getting a little bit hungry looking at it. Sadly, we are, we're past morel season, so that you'll have to wait until next year. But morels are um, one of the few mushrooms that are, ascomy that are an ascomycete. And the final group, um, the group that probably gets the most attention aside from the pathogens are our basidiomycetes. And most of our mushrooms are basidiomycetes. Not, again, not all of them, but, but most of them are. And these tend to be club fungi. And so as we, as we think about how their spores are produced, they're kind of produced more in a club-like um, club -like structure as opposed to that sac. Um, that we have with ascomycetes. So we've talked about fungi and discuss what fungi are, but what are mushrooms? And so mushroom is really, it's a kind of a catch-all term for that fruiting body that protrudes from a substrate and produces spores. Now, often when we think about mushrooms, we're going to be thinking about that um, a very common paracel um, mushroom that we had on the had on the previous on the previous picture, something that has a good cap and a stem going down. But we have a lot of other types of mushrooms out there. And so puff balls and earth stars, they're just going to be round little masses of, of mycelia. And then we have our cap mushrooms. Um, we have some gilled fungi, some shelf fungi. Anytime you see a little shelf-like structure growing out of um, growing out of your tree, that is also also a mushroom. And then we have our jelly um, our jelly fungi as well that are that are mushrooms. And so there is some debate um, in the scientific community: should we call everything a mushroom, or should we have different terms for for the puff balls and the shelf fungi, things like that? I like to keep it simple, and they are all all mushrooms. So other thing that all mushrooms have in common is they are fairly fleshy, at least when they're young. As they harden, they may get kind of leathery um, and a lot tougher. But when young, they are, they are quite fleshy and end up being a very good food source for a lot of different plants, animals, and other fungi that are out there. 
And so one thing to remember is that all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi are mushrooms. And then we always have to talk a little bit about anatomy um, with, with our mushrooms. And so we always have that, or at least with our typical, typical cap mushroom, they have, they, have that, they have a nice long stem, as we can see there. Another name for that stem is a stipe. Um, but they'll have that stipe and on that, that stem. Somewhere on that stem, there may be a ring, another, um, you, or you may hear that ring referred to as an annulus. Um, sometimes that, that annulus is not present or it may be very obscured. And then we have our cap. On top of the cap, sometimes maybe we will have some scales or some other growths that, other growths that form. Often those scales are, um, are a remnant of the universal veil that, that all fungi or that all mushrooms have, at least in their, um, in their very introductory stages. So we look at the underside of the um, underside of the cap of the mushroom cap. There may be gills, there may be pores, or there may be spines. Sometimes those gills or sometimes those gills are going to be very close together. Other times they may be fairly widespread apart. But the thing that the gills, pores, and spines all have in common is that they are there where the spores are actually released. And then down at the bottom is where we have. Um, is where we have our universal veil. And so the, the vulva, the top of the vulva is the universal, um, is, is that veil. Again, like I said, sometimes we have remnants of it on the cap. But then once we go underground, that's where most of that mushroom will actually be living is underground in that mycelial mat. Um, and so again, those long thread-like structures that expand, um, extend much further than we ever see with the actual mushrooms themselves. So first thing in our yard that I'm gonna talk about are slime molds. Um, maybe the most fun type of, uh, type, of, um, type of fungus that we see in our yard. But again, these slime molds are not true fungi. We, we, class, we call them fungi, but they're actually myxomycetes. Um, and they tend to appear in kind of slimy, wet mounds almost overnight. And we can have really large masses of, of the slime that occurs overnight in a variety of colors. Some are gray, yellow, red, orange, um, black, white, all sorts of different colors um, for these slime molds. They tend to be found on, on mulch or other, other plant material. <clears throat> On occasion, we will see them on, on living plant material, such as, such as turf. I've actually been getting a lot of calls about slime molds and turf in some, in some shaded areas where that foliage re, um, stayed wet a lot longer than normal. But the other cool thing about, about slime molds is they, they can move. And so if you look, if you have a slime mold um, patch in your, in your mulch, you look at it one day, you come back two days later, Maybe it looks like it's moved a couple inches or a couple of feet. And the reason it looks like that is because they actually, they actually will move. And so they will form these, um, they, they'll form these uh, plasmodial, plasmodial networks. And the plate that, we, that I have there right in the center um, really shows some of those networks. And sli so slime molds are brilliant at finding the easiest pathway to get from point A to point B. In fact, they were, uh, they were redoing the, um, the subway system in Tokyo a few years ago, right, 15, 20 years ago. And somebody had the thought of, let's see, let's put all of our, all of our subway stations into a, um, onto a plate and then have a slime mold figure out the fastest way to connect all of them. And sure enough, the slime molds um, ended up finding the path, the, the um, quickest way to connect all of the different uh, subway stations in Tokyo. And so slime molds are, are awesome. I, as you can probably tell, I, I love slime molds. They're a lot of fun. We also have our bird's nest fungi. Uh, these are very, very common and commonly found in mulch. 
Um, the nest that we have there often is going to be a half inch or less in diameter. But then inside of that nest, you can see we have all of these eggs. And these eggs are actually the blastiophores. Um, and then within, the, within each of these eggs, they will release a lot of, a lot of fungi. Um, or I'm sorry, they'll release the actual reproductive spores to help that fungus spread to a new area. These guys really aren't harmful, um, same as slime molds, not at all harmful. And sometimes where the slime molds that they may cause um, some aesthetic issues. With bird's nest fungi, they're often too small to really cause, um, cause any issues um, with how things look. But if you have enough of them in your mulch, you, you, may, you may not like them. I personally think they look really, really cool. Next group of um, fungi that I want to talk about are our stink horns. And so stink horns are, um, these guys are actual true fungi. Um, if most of our stink horns are contained in two different genera, the mutinous and the phallus genera. But all of our stink horns have kind of a spongy, a spongy stipe or stem that grows up. And at the top of that stem, is going to be a mass of smelly spores. Um, that's where the where the name comes from. Again, we you know we pathologists and mycologists we're not very um, we're not very unique when it comes to how we name things, and they look like horns that come out that stunk, so we call them stink horns. One of the other cool things about stink horns is they sprout from eggs. And these eggs will often be um, deeper in the soil, maybe eight to 12, 16 inches deep in the soil. And you may just find these, these masses. The pictures that I have there on the bottom, bottom left-hand side of the screen are some of, these, some of these stinkhorn eggs. But when you split them open, you can see that we do have kind of that mushroom structure inside of them. However, these stinkhorn eggs can all, um, they can be very easily confused with snake eggs. So if you are digging some up, um, you may want to be, may want to be mindful that you're not disrupting a, a, um, um, a whole bunch of snake eggs. Next one are ash boletes. And so these guys are found exclusively under ash trees. And they're not a, they're not really a pathogen of, um, of the ash tree, but they do indicate a lar um, something else is going on with the, with the ash tree. And so these mushrooms have formed a symbiotic relationship with the leaf curl ash aphid. And what happens is the, the aphids will feed on the, they'll feed on the, um, feed on the ash leaves, and then they'll, then they'll travel down um, and actually lay their eggs on the on the ash roots. As the, um, as the aphids then are feeding on the, on, the, on the ash roots, they produce some honeydew or kind of some sticky sugary substance. And the fungus then is actually feeding on the honeydew produced by the aphids. In return for that, that nice sticky honeydew, the fungus then produces a, um, a protective a, protect, a protective structure around those, um, around those aphid larvae and eggs to help protect them from predation within the soil. And so really a, um, a pretty, you know, pretty, cool, uh, pretty cool symbiotic relationship that, that these guys have. But one thing with ash boletes to remember is they're not a true bolete, um, but the name, the name has just stuck. We have a lot of mushrooms that'll show up on trees um, you know, have a few of the more common ones um, uh, pictured here. They can be found on living trees. They can be found on dead trees. Um, really depends on depends on what type of mushroom we're looking at. But if we find them on a tree that is otherwise healthy, it's not a sign of an immediate problem. But that mushroom, it is feeding on something within the tree. And so it is causing a little bit of wood decay. So it's not an, again, not an immediate problem with the tree, but we really recommend just keeping an eye on that tree for other signs of stress. Maybe it's dropping leaves early or it's late to leaf out. 
Um, and if we start to see that, um, some of some of these other signs of stress on the trees, then we'll want to start thinking about maybe um, maybe replacing this tree in the future. And in our lawns, we can we can also have our fairy rings. Um, and these fairy rings are often kind of circular, or they they, they may be semicircular. It can be anywhere anywhere from about one inch in diameter in diameter to the largest one that's been recorded is it was over sixty feet in diameter, but that circle is actually the outer edge of the mycelial growth. And as I mentioned, you know, mushrooms are very good at, um, at nutrient decomposition. And so that ring, we may have some dead grass that, um, that forms there, but typically we're going to have some taller, thicker, darker, and just overall healthier grass at the edge of that growth ring because the fungus, um, because the fungi, are so good at, at breaking down um, breaking down other soil nutrients and then give um, and making them available to the turf. In lawns, I tend to not to do to do a whole lot with with fairy rings, but if you are in a heavily uh, managed landscape such as a golf course, um, these things can be can be very detrimental, um, and a lot of golfers aren't going to want to want to be. Um, on, on some greens that are all covered with fairy rings. We also have our puff balls. Um, they tend to be large masses of, of fungi. These guys don't have a stock um, to hold them up off of the ground. Often they're going to be white at first, but they will change their color with um, color with age. These are these guys are very common in late fall or sorry, late summer and the fall, but generally aren't going to be harmful to our to our environment. And as the name puffball suggests, you can kind of squeeze them and get a puff of stuff that comes out. And so that, that little cloud that we can see there, um, again, those are hundreds and thousands of fungal spores that are then released. As far as managing mushrooms, um, in, in the landscape or other fungi in the landscape. Generally, I really think that we should just let them, just let them be. They're, most of them aren't causing any real problems. Um, most of the mushrooms that we have in Nebraska aren't, aren't, are not poisonous either. So they're not doing a whole lot. So, so I tend to not recommend a whole lot of management, but if you do, if you are wanting to get rid of them, Generally, fungicides are not going to be a good option. These mushrooms are feeding on something that's much deeper in the soil than the, fungi than the fungicide will penetrate. And so even doing a fungicidal drench often will not be enough to, to, get, um, to kill the fungus. So we can physically remove them via mowing or just um, with our hands and a knife. Managing our thatch layers tends to, uh, tends to reduce our, um, the number of mushrooms as well. In the in thatch, we um, have a lot more a lot more moisture that the mushrooms are able to utilize to to sprout. If you are if you are having issues with mushrooms or fungi in your mulch beds, maybe look into using a conifer-based mulch. Um, a lot we don't see near as many fungi growing on on our conifer-based mulches. But if you are looking to get um, looking for a way to get rid of the mushrooms that are growing in your lawn, I often just recommend fertilizer. Um, and so an addition, maybe an extra burst of, of nitrogen, the nitrogen will stimulate root growth. The roots are really good at helping break down some of that woody, uh, that woody material lower in the soil that the fungi are feeding off. And as we're thinking about mushroom ID, photos um, can work. We always wanna make sure we have a picture of the cap, both the top and the underside of the cap. And also we want a good picture of the stem and then additional information such as, what is it growing on? Where did you find it? Um, was it a single mushroom or were they growing in clumps? That's always very beneficial in terms of mushroom ID. But one thing I really, really want to, um, uh, want to, uh, to mention here is never eat a mushroom you find in the landscape unless you are 100% sure of what it is. There are a lot of poisonous mushrooms out there that look quite a bit like our edible ones. 
And these poisonous mushrooms, they may not kill you, but you will certainly have a very upset stomach for, um, for a couple of days. And we do have mushrooms that can, that, that can kill you. They're not very common in Nebraska, but they do exist. Thank you.